Hello everyone. So today we have a really interesting concept in number theory and we're going to be discussing about parity. Now what is parity? Parity is basically odd or even, right? So we essentially check if a certain expression is odd or even and then the certain and then we figure out some cases based upon the fact that it is odd or even or you know, it just helps us to simplify a few things if we can uh, find out the parity of a given expression. And parity is actually a concept that is used a lot in uh, math olympiads, especially at the IQM, AMC and such levels. So it's actually good to know concept because you see it repeating many times. And uh, yeah, so we have a couple of problems today and hope you like it. So yeah, we have two problems, problem 8 and problem 28 from IQM 2021. And in this video, we first have a warm up problem. And the idea of that is, you know, in many of these exams, IQM, pre arm etc. The first few problems are actually warm up problems. They can, they can actually be done fairly easily. They're mostly trivial, can be done in elementary manner. They don't require a very in-depth knowledge of number theory, algebra whatsoever. They just uh, try to test your basics of those of those uh, areas. So we'll start with a warm-up problem, and then we're going to look at a parity-based problem in number theory. How parity actually helps us, and how parity is actually a process, or it's rather like a thinking process or an objective uh, problem-solving strategy. You can call it that. You should keep in mind during exams. It can really help you a lot. Then we have some book suggestions for the IQM, and at the end, a similar but challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010. Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical olympiads, physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so this problem number eight that I marked is a warm problem. And they're telling us that a five digit number in base 10 has its k, k plus 1, k plus 2, 3, k, k plus 3 in that order from left to right. If this number is m square from some value of m, find the sum of digits of m. Now, yeah, this is a warm problem. You really don't need any advanced knowledge of the base system or even number theory in general. You just need to know algebra and a little bit of uh, maybe Diophantine equation or casework. Or even if you don't know that, it is probably solvable. So what are they saying? It's saying a five digit number in base 10. So base 10 is a regular system. For example, if I write a number A, B, C in base 10, this is represented as 100A plus 10B plus C. If I write a number A, B, C, D in base 10, the decimal system. So this will be 10,000A plus 1,000B plus, okay, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. This will be 1,000A plus 100B plus 10C plus D. But you get the point, right? So this is how we would represent a number in um, in the decimal format, in the base 10, right? And they're telling us that a five digit number in base 10 has these digits. So k, k plus one, k plus two, then we have three k and k plus three. So these are the five digits from left to right. And uh, well, what are certain observations that I can make from this? So first of all, it's a five digit number. So k cannot be zero. Because if k was zero, then it would be a four digit number. Right? So k cannot be zero. The second observation is one of the digits is 3k. So k can effectively only be 1, 2, and 3. Because if k is equal to 4, it would become 12. And 12 is not a digit, right? 12 is not a digit. Digit is only from 0 to 9. These are digits, right? 12 is not a digit. So k can only be 1, 2, and 3. And this really helps us to simplify things. Why? Because, well, this uh, this is the number, right? If I, if this is the number, if I can expand that and write it in the full format, like, like we did for a, b, c, d, or a plus a, b, c, Let's see what we get. So we'll get k plus 3 plus 10 times 3k plus 100 times k plus 2 plus 1000 times k plus 1 plus 10,000 times k because it's a 5 digit number is equal to m squared for some value of m. And we need to find the sum of digits of that value of m. So if I just simplify this, what will I get? k plus 3 plus 30k plus 100k plus 200 plus 1000k plus 1000 plus 10,000k and that is essentially equal to m squared. So if I just calculate this, this becomes 10,000, this will be 11,000, 11,131. So 11,131k plus this will become 1203 is equal to m squared. And after this point, you really don't need to do anything much. You don't need to factorize this or anything. You know that k is equal to 1, 2, 3. These are only the three cases of k. If you just plug it in and check it out, uh, for what value of k this gives a perfect square. And k is equal to 1 does not give a perfect square. So this expression is not a perfect square for k is equal to 1. And neither is it for k is equal to 2. But for k is equal to 3, you actually get a perfect square. right? So m square 
is 11,131 times 3 plus 1203. And if you actually do the math, do some calculations over here, m squared is becomes 34596. Now, how do you calculate this? Right? How do you calculate this in an exam? Now, you, m square is 3, 4, 5, 9, 6. So, what I would do over here, instead of directly taking the square root, what I would do is maybe check out some values. So, I'll check out maybe what is 180 squared. Right? Because we, we generally don't know what the square root of this is. Right? So, I'll check out what is 180 squared. Then, I'll check out what is 185 squared. Then, maybe I'll check out what is 190 squared. And just figuring out in a way. And why am I picking these numbers? Because essentially, I know that 200 squared. How much is this? This is 4 and then 4 zeros. So, it's 40,000. Now this number is obviously less than 40,000, so it's somewhere going to be like maybe 180 to 200 range. That's my estimation. Maybe 180 to 190 range. Right? That's my estimation. And when you look at certain things like this, it's ending with 6. It's ending with 6. And so the only so only way it can be is it can be either 184 or it can be 186. And because the square of these numbers would end in 6. And if you actually check out, 186 is the correct answer as 186 squared is 3, 4, 5, 9, 6. But therefore, m is 186 and the sum of dates of m is 15. So that is how you would solve this problem and that was a pretty elementary problem. All you really needed to do was hang in there a little bit and do, do some calculations, do some math. The second problem is actually a little bit good. It's the 28th problem so it's near the end of the test and a natural number n is said to be good if n is the sum of r consecutive positive integers for some r greater than 2 and we have to find the number of good numbers in this given set 1 to 100. So what's it saying? So it's saying if any number n can be written as a sum of, let's say, r consecutive numbers, so 2 plus 3 plus 4, so n is equal to 9 is a good number, right? It's a good number. It can be written as a sum of r consecutive numbers. Now, an important thing to note is that it does not need to be consecutive. So for example, it does not need to start from 1. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, this is valid. However, this is not the only good values of n. So n can start from let's say 30 plus 31 plus 32. This is also a good value of n. Right? It's the sum of consecu r consecutive numbers where r is equal to 3. And obviously it need not start from 1. That's what they're given the problem. And a couple of ways to do this. The easier one is um, obviously through parity analysis. And there are the other way that I kind of found uh, was that you just make cases. So for example, the first case is uh, you make where n is a sum of two numbers. n can be 1 plus 2 n can be 2 plus 3, n can be 3 plus 4, and this goes all the way up to 49 plus 51, so you get 49 cases for this. Right, so there are 49 good values of n. So similarly, you do n as a sum of 3 numbers, then you do n as a sum of 4 numbers, n as a sum of 5 numbers, and so on and so forth, in the set 1 to 100. This is really important, because this is really making a calculation easier, if you do it via this method. But, this is obviously a well and good method, if this clicks for you in the exam, you should definitely go forward with it. What I'm going to discuss with you is a method of parity. And this is probably a um, little better method, it's more algebraic, but uh, it's nice, right? So what are they saying? N is the sum of R consecutive numbers. How can I represent that? So that'll be, let's say K plus K plus 1 plus K plus 2. And this will go all the way up till K plus R minus 1, right? Why R minus 1? Because if you put R is equal to 1, you'll get K, which is the first term. You put r is equal to 2, you'll get k plus 1, which is the second term. So it kind of makes sense. The most common mistake that people would do over here, they just put n is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up till r. Obviously, like I said before, it does not need to start from 1, so obviously this is completely incorrect. But okay, anyways, so I can write n is equal to k, and k is being added r number of times. So it basically becomes k times r, right? Plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up till r minus 1. And um, what do we have over here? So if I if I can like calculate this out, this will be kr plus sigma. Sigma basically up to it's basically up to r minus one term. So one of the things to note is that when we have one plus two plus three all the way up to r, this is r times r plus one by two. But when I have this one plus two plus three all the way up to r minus one, I'll have r minus one times r by two. Why? We just put r minus one instead of r over here. So this becomes r times r minus 1 over 2. Just change the color. So n becomes kr plus r times r minus 1. You multiply by 2 on both sides. So you get this. And if you take r common, you get 2k plus r minus 1. 
now what now what do we do now well now you just split it up into two cases so case one r is odd and this is kind of what i was telling you about parity analysis r is odd if r is odd r minus 1 is even if r minus 1 is even r minus 1 plus 2k is even why because 2k is always even and even plus even is even right so this thing is even this thing is odd and even times an odd is an even right so that works out so you essentially need to know that it's an even times odd it's something like this it's not even times you know it's odd times odd it's even times odd let's analyze case 2 So case two is obviously where r is even. R can be either odd or even. If r is even, r minus one is odd. So what would be two k plus r minus one? This is an even number plus an odd number. And even plus odd is, for example, twelve plus three. It is fifteen, so it is odd. So again, here you are multiplying an even by an odd term. So basically, two n is essentially an even times an odd term. So what will be a bad n? A bad n will be when n is of the form two raised to the power k, right? Why? Because then this would be two times two raised to the power k, and this would be an even number. This would be an even number, a product of two even numbers. But on the right hand side, you would have an even number and odd number. So n can never be two raised to the power k. Any other value of n is good. So for example, if n is two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. n will be bad and obviously the set is 1 to 100 we need to remember that set is 1 to 100 so if n is any of these quantities n is bad so what are the good numbers what are the good n there was to be 100 minus these things 1 2 3 4 5 6 and obviously 1 right cuz how can we ignore that if you put k is equal to 0 you get 1 so what are the good numbers of n 100 minus 7 and that becomes 93 which is an answer Essentially, what we really did over here was just parity. After you get this, a lot of people can just wonder what they need to do, and a good problem-solving technique to remember is parity. Right? You check the parity, and you can actually see what values of n is it bad for. Right? And once you do that, you'll get the you'll, you'll get the desired answer. So yeah, I really hope you learned a lot from that. Okay. So after that, we have certain book sessions for the IQM, Challenge and Three D Pre-College Mathematics. Mathematical circles, an excursion in mathematics, a test of mathematics at 10 plus 2 level, elementary number theory by David Burton, elementary theory of numbers by Sipinski, principles and techniques in combinatorics, and obviously problem solving techniques by Arthur and Jell. Great. So after that, we have a similar but challenging problem, and I want you to prove that there exists infinitely many positive integers such that the greater than zero function of n root 2 and n root 3 have the same parity. So they are both even. They are both odd. either of these two can work and where obviously uh, this represents the greatest integer function of x also called as the floor function right so i hope you know that what that is and yeah if you make any progress on it or if you're able to solve that please let me know in the comment section below and until then i'll see you in the next video thank you very much and bye bye the programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics and they are personalized with one on one training individual evaluation and remedial sessions The reason Chinta students are successful over the last ten years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympians from leading universities in India, United States, and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR, and IISC. For more information. visit chinta.com